Hi, welcome to Bookie. To unlock more world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features. Today we'll unlock the book is Paris Burning. Paris is a famous city of fashion, art, culture, and romance. When it comes to Paris, many people will think of its famous buildings. Notre Dame de Paris, the Louvre, and the Eiffel Tower, which are all must-see sites of interest. But did you know we almost lost the chance forever to see these beautiful places? In the early days of World War II, Hitler swept across Europe, and quickly occupied Poland, Denmark, Norway, the Netherlands, Belgium, and other countries. In June 1940, he conquered Paris, the principal city in France. From then on, Paris was under German occupation. It wasn't until 1944, when Allied forces landed in Normandy, that Parisians saw their hopes for liberation realized. However, Hitler had fallen into madness, demanding that his troops defend Paris at all costs, even to the last man. Meanwhile, Hitler had made up his mind to implement a scorched earth policy in Paris. He issued orders for planting explosives in various places of importance in the city. If Paris had fallen, he would have detonated all the bombs to reduce Paris to a pile of ruins. Furthermore, forces both inside and outside of Paris were hostile towards one another, and always in conflict. At that time, Paris continually faced the threat of destruction. Is Paris burning was a question that Hitler bitterly put to his chief of the general staff on the day of the liberation of Paris on August 25, 1944. So, how did Paris escape the fate of being burnt to the ground? This audio issue will explain the story to you in detail. The book was co-written by Larry Collins, correspondent of Newsweek, and Dominique Lapierre, correspondent of Paris Match. Both authors fully made use of their expertise, and spent three years gathering material from various sources. They interviewed over 800 people, from aides of Eisenhower and de Gaulle to ordinary soldiers and citizens, and they used personal experiences from 536 of them. Consequently, the vivid language and well-documented historical sources show that every event in the book has its basis in fact. Also, we can track the whereabouts of every person and source in each sentence of the book. The authors used vivid writing to reveal the overall process of Paris's liberation. Next, I'll explain to you the three sections in detail. Part 1, How Paris Faced the Threat of War's Destruction. Part 2, The Struggles of Parisians, Underground Activities of Communists and Gaullists. Part 3, The Liberation of Paris. First, let's look at Part 1, How Paris Faced the Threat of War's Destruction. After Paris fell to the Germans in 1940, its people seemed to gradually become accustomed to the occupation. People were getting used to returning home before curfew. Once the curfew time had passed, whether you could return home depended on the mood of the German soldiers patrolling that night. If the German soldiers caught Parisians after curfew, and they were in a good mood, they might make these Parisians shine their boots all night. But if the resistance groups had killed a German and German soldiers were in a bad mood, these Parisians would be immediately executed. People were accustomed to hunger. At that time, Parisians would get two eggs, three ounces of cooking oil, and two ounces of margarine on their ration tickets. The meat ration was even smaller. According to a Parisian joke, it could be wrapped in a subway ticket provided the ticket hadn't been used. If it had, the meat might have fallen out through the hole punched in the ticket by the conductor's hole puncher. People were also accustomed to living without gas and electricity. The housewives of Paris learned to cook over a stove made of 10-gallon cans welded together. They used old newspapers as fuel. Moreover, they crumbled these old newspapers into balls and sprinkled with water, which allowed them to burn more slowly. In the meantime, of course, Parisians used to romance could no longer go to the countryside for holidays as usual. Tens of thousands of people could only cram onto the riverside of the Seine for sunbathing. Thus, the muddy river became the world's largest swimming pool. In June 1944, 
the Allied forces successfully landed in Normandy under the cover of many aircraft and warships. The news began to inspire Parisians, who saw their hope for liberation. However, the news drove a man even crazier in a faraway place called East Prussia. He was Adolf Hitler. For Hitler, Paris was the last trophy left from his five-year war. The fall of Paris would be equivalent to the loss of France, because all France's major roads and rivers converged on Paris, which was the heart of France. If Paris fell, it would lead to the loss of the entire coastal plain north of the Seine, which would cost Germany its rocket launch site for long-range operations against Britain. Besides, the Allied armies would be on the doorstep of the Reich. Therefore, Hitler issued orders to his commander of Gross Paris Dietrich von Schaltitz, whose loyalty to the Reich had never flagged. Schaltitz was ordered to defend Paris to the last man, and never to let it fall into the hands of the Allies. Even if the Allies seized the city, they would find nothing but a pile of ruins. Who was Dietrich von Schaltitz? Hitler's chief personnel officer rated Schaltitz as an officer, who had never questioned an order no matter how harsh it was. Schaltitz was born into a family of soldiers, with three generations of Prussian soldiery. He had received his schooling in the rigidly disciplined Saxon Cadet Corps, and he always strictly executed orders without questioning them. From 1940 to 1943, he was often ordered to reduce a city to a pile of ruins. From Rotterdam to Sevastopol, he earned his reputation as a smasher of cities. As he would one day confess, since Sebastopol, it has been my fate to cover the retreat of our armies, and to destroy the cities behind them. He was the man Hitler needed in Paris, because there were widespread sentiments of defeat and disloyalty in the inner circles of the German army at the time. Schaltitz was the only man whose loyalty and capacity were beyond question, so he was the best man to execute Hitler's orders. Furthermore, Hitler assigned not only Schaltitz, but also demolition experts to Paris. According to orders issued by Hitler, these demolition experts would place mines and bombs in various important buildings in the city. If Paris were to fall, the scorched earth policy would be implemented to reduce Paris, as well as its glorious architecture and art treasures, to a pile of ruins. On the other hand, after the landing of the Allied forces at Normandy, internal forces in France also began to prepare for the upcoming liberation of Paris. To assist the operations of the Allies, various armed resistance groups in France began to operate secretly as early as the beginning of 1944. They formed the French forces of the interior, and plagued the German occupying forces with guerrilla warfare. Like the resistance movements in many countries, France's domestic resistance was also composed of various forces. The two largest forces came from the French Communist Party and Charles de Gaulle respectively. The Free French Army was led by de Gaulle, who had been in exile in Britain. Although the French Communist Party hadn't joined the resistance movement for very long, its army was the most organized, disciplined, and bravest among all resistance groups. The Communists fought bravely during the war, and they were continually expanding in size and influence. Due to their extremely high prestige within France, they had become the most prominent political organization in the country. They had been fighting for the previous three years. When France was about to be liberated, the Communists were planning on staging a revolt in Paris to cooperate with the Allies to liberate Paris in one fell swoop. Meanwhile, de Gaulle also wanted to liberate Paris as soon as possible. But unlike the Communists, de Gaulle aimed to take control of Paris, and establish his position before the Communists could. De Gaulle believed that he was in a race with the Communists. Though the immediate goal was Paris, the prize would be for all of France. For this reason, in 1943, he ordered that no weapons were to be parachuted to the French communists. Since D-Day, he had worked out a plan. All civil authority had to be placed in the hands of personnel appointed by de Gaulle, for each parcel of land liberated in France. To prevent the communists from seizing power, de Gaulle issued orders to his agent Jacques Chaban Delmas, who was planted within the resistance. Delmas was to retain control of the armed resistance in Paris, and under no circumstances could an uprising be triggered without de Gaulle's consent. 
it meant that Delmas would do everything he could to disrupt the communist uprising. But to the surprise of the French Communist Party in De Gaulle, Alain Perpizat, a young medical student parachuted from a British bomber, disrupted their plans to liberate Paris prematurely. The medical student was a French spy, who crossed the German blockade, and delivered a message that the Allies would delay the liberation of Paris. It was indeed a piece of bad news for the resistance in Paris. Without the support of the Allied forces, their uprisings would suffer significant losses. Not only were high casualties inevitable, but many historical sites might also be destroyed. Just like Warsaw, which was reduced to a pile of ruins right before the Russians could come to its liberation. Presumably, you are also wondering, why did the Allies delay the liberation of Paris? For the Allies, Paris was a dilemma, more like a hot potato being passed around than a clear prize in the war effort. As the Supreme Allied Commander, Eisenhower had his considerations. Postponing the liberation of Paris was a decision he had to make, according to accurate military analysis from the Supreme Allied Command Headquarters. Eisenhower was clear about the profound significance of liberating Paris, yet he had to compromise in the face of reality. He was convinced the Germans would put up a strong fight defending Paris. The liberation of Paris would require prolonged street fighting similar to that in Stalingrad. Such a battle would ravage the beautiful city, which he wasn't willing to see. More importantly, the Allies would be responsible for providing daily rations to 3.5 million Parisians after the liberation of Paris. The number of rations was more than enough for maintaining eight divisions of the Allied forces. Moreover, the transportation of daily necessities such as food and medicine, would require a large amount of gasoline, which was the most precious resource for the Allies. All these factors were related to the outcome of the war. Therefore, the Allies decided to bypass Paris and not liberate it for the time being. To end the war early, they prioritized the most critical resources for helping with the offensive against the Nazis on German soil. Hence, they informed the resistance groups in Paris to postpone an uprising. But would the French Communist Party and de Gaulle agree? Wonderful. We've just covered part one above. After D-Day, Hitler intended to implement a scorched earth policy, and the French people were desperately anxious to liberate Paris. Even the French Communist Party was planning to stage an uprising within Paris. Meanwhile, de Gaulle had his opportunist goal too. But the Allies decided to postpone the liberation of Paris. The outbreak of rebellion could occur at any minute, yet the Allied forces were not able to arrive in time. This beautiful city was continually facing the threat of getting burnt to the ground, what would be its fate? Today we are just sharing limited bookie. To unlock more key insights of world-class bestseller, please download our app. Just search for B-O-O-K-E-Y at Apple Store or Google Play. You will get 7 days free trail with more features.